In this video, I'm going to write a simple unit test in an existing Maven project in IntelliJ IDEA. Let's take a look at our project so far. We have a class called Vehicle, which is essentially a Java Bean or a DTO with one extra feature added to it. So first of all, what do we mean by Java Bean or a DTO? Well, it effectively is a noun. So a noun, person, place, or thing, and it has attributes that are adjectives that describe that noun. So miles per gallon, gallons of gas and odometer, these are all things that describe a vehicle. Now, as is typical with a plain old Java object, we have getter and setter methods for each of those attributes, and those attributes are declared private. This is what we call encapsulation. Now, additionally, we have a method here that does something. That method's called go. Now, Java beans oftentimes will just have those getters and setters and attributes. They won't oftentimes have behavior, but just to keep things simple, I have these all together in one class. Now, if we take a look at the go method, we see that we set, we receive some distance we're traveling. Then we update the gallons of gas to be the previous value of gallons of gas minus mild, miles driven uh, divided by miles per gallon. And then we also update the odometer by miles driven. So this is fairly straightforward to test. As a matter of fact, so far we've used kind of an interactive prompt to input some variables and to test visually. But the trick is that this doesn't necessarily scale. In other words, manual testing is good for a purpose, but we don't want to be robots. We don't want to manually test things that can be tested automatically because then we can focus our time on more value added things. And the things that are routine and mundane, we can simply automate. And so that's our goal with this test. So this is a Maven project, which means it has a separate test directory. So I'm going to right click on Java under test, and I'm going to say new class. Uh, JUnit class is really just a Java class with some extra annotations. That's all. Vehicle test. We want the word test to be in this class name somewhere because there's something called a Surefire plugin that's going to run these tests for us automatically. And it's going to look not only in this directory, but it's going to be looking for classes that begin or end with that word test. So vehicle test, add to get. Uh, okay, now, when we make a test method, number one, we want to annotate it with a test annotation. And okay, well, uh, IntelliJ is telling me, I, I don't know what you mean here, buddy. So what I'm going to do is add JUnit581 to our class path and then it will be able to recognize this test annotation, and there we go. You also notice if I go to POM XML, we knew, have a new entry here, a new dependency. And so this was added when we added that JUnit 581. It adds it to Maven. The nice thing about this is anywhere we deploy this project now or deploy the source code, it's going to know that that is a dependency that's required for our project. And also we can use Maven's update and its ability to store thing in the .m2 library to get access to this library and to use it in this project as well as other projects if needed. In any case, we go back to vehicle test. Well, we can't just have an annotation without a method. And when we're writing a test method, we typically want it to be very descriptive, even more descriptive than most methods. So they tend to be fairly long. We'll start with public void. And then what we typically do is use the method that we're testing, which is go and then an underscore, and then we describe exactly what we're testing. So you see go, our method, increase odometer by 100 and decrease gallons of gas by five when miles per gallon is 20. So very descriptive of what we're testing. And now I could just put an assert in here and that would be fine. I'm going to go one step further and use behavior-driven design syntax. Behavior-driven design means that we write our tests in a series of three steps, given, which is any preconditions, when, which are steps that we take, and then the then part, which is where we have our asserts. So given when then syntax, also called Gherkin syntax, also called behavior-driven design. One nice thing about behavior-driven design is that these are words that people understand, given, when, then. And therefore, we get the best of everybody in a group when we're writing our test cases because anybody can come up with a test case. And that means we take everybody's experience and everybody's knowledge, and we're able to have broad coverage of what our test should do. That's number one. Number two, when we write the, and when I say we come up with them, I don't mean people are in here writing code. I mean, it's more like we're writing a document to say these are examples 
that elaborate our requirements. So we can all sit around in the room, type in a Word doc or a Confluence doc or something like that and say, okay, these are given when then examples that, that describe this requirement. Now, what we do then is what I'm doing right now, which is we take those given when thens, which were decided by a group of people, both te technical and not, and we use that as a script to write our unit test. So the given when and the then will typically be three separate methods that are invoked from our test method. And we can use the smartness of the development environment to help us create these. Let me go ahead and type them out first. So you see, once again, very descriptive names here as if they came directly from a requirements document. Given vehicle has zero odometer, 15 gallons of gas, and 20 miles per gallon. Very clear on the starting position of our vehicle, the starting state. And remember, given is where we do any of that setup, so that makes sense to be here. When drive 100, those are the steps we're going to take. Then odometer increases by 100 and gallons of gas decreases by 5. That's our expected outcome. So these are the methods that I want. I'm going to have the IDE help me, and I'm just going to mouse over and choose Create on each of these. Do Alt-Enter and Create. Notice I am doing them from the bottom up, and that's because when the IDE creates these, it creates these directly under the method where these method calls live. So I do them bottom up so that it will create it in the right given when then order. If I did it top down, it'd be when given then or something like that. Uh, and by the way, just want to reinforce here, the difference between a method and a method call. This is a method. This is a call to that method. This is a method. This is a call to that method. So I just want to distinguish there if you're a bit newer to programming, that concept can get a bit confusing. Okay, let's start with our given. So I'm going to declare a vehicle up at the top. So the data type is vehicle, which is the class over here that we're testing. And the variable name is vehicle with a lowercase v. Pay special attention to that. Now we'll do our setup here in the given. First, we call the constructor. Then uh, let's, have, let's do it in the order that we have on the method. So odometer has zero odometer. So vehicle set odometer zero, uh, 15 gallons of gas, and 20 miles per gallon. OK, so that's our initialization step. When drive 100, and notice because the vehicle is declared as an attribute of this test class, it's available in each of these methods that I have down here. So we've done our setup, we've done our steps, and now we need to do our asserts. Assert equals is a method that's given to us by JUnit. We'll typically start with an expected value. So uh, let's say 100 should be the odometer. And then we'll start with the actual value. Vehicle, get odometer. Now assert equals, we're likely going to need to import this. That works. And terminate with a semicolon. And we'll do one more assert equals because we're asserting the odometer and we're also asserting the gallons of gas. So gallons of gas started at 15. 100 miles divided by 20 miles per gallon is 5 gallons of gas consumed, so it should be 10. So notice expected value is a hard-coded number, and then the actual, we're simply calling this object. So uh, we have our test set up, and you notice I get a couple of options here. One is I can run every test in this file. Typically a test, a class will have multiple tests in it. In this case, I only have one. Or I can run this test individually. So I'm going to go ahead and say run. And let's take a look at the output. No big surprise, the test passes. If I were to intentionally make the test fail by giving it an invalid uh, expected, let's see, let's watch what happens when it fails. You see, now we get a red line, and it's very descriptive about what happened. Expected 105, actual 100, and it takes us all the way down to the line that failed. So if you do have a unit test failure, uh, look at this output because it will give you a big hint on what went wrong. As a matter of fact, we can also debug these tests. And I strongly recommend this if you are working with a unit test that's failing, or even if you're doing test-driven design and you want to take a look at what the test is going to be testing. Snap a breakpoint, walk through it, and then you'll see why it fails. And that's where unit testing is really cool because we start with requirements, we go to the given when then, that becomes our unit test. Now, we know what our program should do. Now, if the program doesn't do that, the program doesn't meet the requirements, right? So we know when the unit test passes that our program meets the requirements. So what if it doesn't meet the requirements? Well, I snap a breakpoint there, and now I can choose debug. Now, the breakpoint is in the when part, so it's going to go ahead and do the given. It's already done the given. Now it's in the when part. Now, take a look. Notice I'm on vehicle test. 
and noticed I'm on Wind Drive 100 and I'm on Vehicle Go. But watch what happens when I choose Step In. When I choose Step In, I'm in the Vehicle class now, and I'm in the Go method, and as a matter of fact, we can take a look down here in the debugger and see miles per gallon is 20, gallons of gas 15, odometer is zero. And we know how this computation works, so this should give us gallons of gas 10, and should give us odometer 100. Let's go ahead and step over. And you see gallons of gas has dropped to 10, step over again. And you see odometer is now 100. Step over again, that takes us back to our win. And then that takes us back to our test method. Now we can step into the then. And now we can watch both of our asserts pass. And we can go ahead and allow the program to continue. Keeping in mind that that unit test is typically a reflection of the requirements, the ability to run tests locally is extremely powerful. The ability to debug your program is also very powerful, especially against this very solid representation of those requirements. So running it locally is a big bonus. One neat thing is we can also run it in a CICD type environment. As you see here, where we have a GitHub repository and the tests are run automatically and it puts a very easy to see green check if it passes or red X if it fails. That's a very trending topic right now, the ability to have these tests run, run automatically. So in our next video, I'm going to show you how to do that. Meanwhile, I hope this video was helpful, and I look forward to seeing your comments. Thank you.